just to tell you that my body has not been well, but I'm talking to it. <laughs> We're going to begin this evening with two lines that are so important, extremely important to me all my life. So we have, although consenting to mortal ignorance, we did that last week, his knowledge shared the light ineffable. Now, Sri Aurobindo capitalizes the word light. And he, sa he tells us that light is primarily a spiritual manifestation of the divine reality illuminative and creative. Material light is a subsequent representation or conversion of it into matter for the purposes of the material energy. And now this is... I'll never forget this. Our sense by its incapacity has invented darkness. In truth, there is nothing but light. Only it is a power of light, either above or below our poor human vision's limited range. For do not imagine that light is created by the suns. The suns are only physical concentrations of light. But the splendor they concentrate for us is self-born and everywhere. God is everywhere, and wherever God is, there is light. And that is from the hour of God. Now, Mother tells us that the light, this is a, a note that she wrote to my friend Dimitri von Morenschild. And he shared it with me. Of course, now it's all over, but it's wonderful. The light is everywhere. The force is everywhere. And the world is so small. Oh. So what we have to understand by this extraordinary passage is that the divine in his transcendence is perfect, immutable, and only when he comes down, he diminishes his power of light until it seems to us almost darkness, but it is not. And so he tells us that there is nothing but light. a strength of the original permanence. Note here that he capitalizes the word P of permanence because it means that it's the property of being able to exist for indefinite duration. Of course, the divine exists for all time. And this earth is not going to collapse or be hit by an, uh, an asteroid or, or be dis destroyed by another war. There's no possibility of it, Mother tells us. Entangled in the moment and its flow, he kept the vision of the vasts behind. Now, that's very important. Even though the divine comes down into a human body and is entangled to some degree in its flow. And yesterday I talked with Ranga and he's starting to share all wonderful things with me. So Nirod Bharan is telling him, you know, why don't you give me poetry? You give 
uh, Archika poetry all the time. And Sri Aurobindo says, Archika is twice the man of sorrows that you are. <laughs> but but, uh, but it, then Sri Aurobindo says to him, what time do you want to write poetry? He says, two in the afternoon. Sri Aurobindo says, okay. And he comes down and gives him poetry. Oh. Archaka. Archaka. Yeah, unfortunately, Archaka died at 43. Narad, Uma is asking, are you talking Arjava and Archaka? They're two different people or same? Sorry. Arjava. You meant Arjava. Arjava. Archika was a Russian guy yeah. who had many, many spiritual visions. Yeah. And he would constantly meet with Dmitri in Golkond. This is Arjuna. Thank you. So not Arjuna, not Archika, but Arjava. Okay. And this entanglement you're talking about, that's quantum entanglement, right? That's what? Quantum entanglement, which is now the buzzword in science that uh, this non-duality yes quantumly entangled in energy. yes but but here I think it means even a little different a little more than that because when the divine comes down as the avatar he still is not free of the human problems because how else can he solve them so he's entangled in that whole flow. Is that what you meant? Well, I, I mean that, but that we're not separate. And so no. There's, there's no, no. There's no. no parts and whole, and the divine is there, we're here. None of that is yeah. true, even on the physical level. Absolutely. Yeah. He's in the stone also. That's right. That's right. The stone cannot speak, yeah. but it holds the divine consciousness. Right. Okay. <clears throat> A power was in him from the unknowable. And uh, Sri Aurobindo gives us a definition of the unknowable. Very brief, but very beautiful. From the life divine. The unknowable is something to us, supreme, wonderful, and ineffable, which continually, continually formulates itself to our consciousness and continually escapes from the formulation it has made. So he capitalized unknowable here. An archivist of the symbols of the beyond. What is an archivist? Some who preserves, organizes, rare records, documents. And he is an archivist of the symbols of the beyond. All of Savitri is in symbols because we couldn't understand it if Sri Aurobindo used the very highest language. So we see all these symbols and we have to try to understand them with our physical minds. A treasurer of superhuman dreams, he bore the stamp of mighty memories and shed their grandiose ray on human life. His days were a long growth to the Supreme. I believe I talked to you about grandiose last week. No? I didn't? Okay, so this is a discussion Amal and I had. And we see that today sometimes grandiose is used in a pejorative sense such as pertaining to exaggerated belief or claims of one important one's importance or identity often manifested by delusions of great wealth power or frame fame or something that is grand or magnificent or something that is trying to be impressive but is much too large making it seem pretentious or overdone. Well, grandiose in Savitri is always 
massive, vast, huge, never in a negative sense. His days were a long growth to the Supreme. Sri Aurobindo, in the synthesis, whoever the recipient, whatever the gift, it is the Supreme, the eternal in things, who receives and accepts it. A very important line now. Even if it be rejected or ignored by the immediate, immediate recipient, for the Supreme who transcends the universe is yet here too. However veiled, in us and in the world, and in its happenings, he is there as the omniscient witness and receiver of all our works and their secret master. So we begin now this next page of Ashwapati's spiritual journey, the yoga of the king, the yoga of the soul's release. So we look at what Ashwapati is experiencing, and we look at him also, and he is called a skyward being, nourishing its roots on sustenance from occult spiritual founts. So what are these occult spiritual founts? Sri Aurobindo gives us an exact meaning of the term. And uh, let me first give you the standard de definitions from our Western dictionaries. Hidden from view, concealed, beyond the realm of human comprehension, inscrutable, available only to the initiate, secret. But Sri Aurobindo tells us, the ancient knowledge in all countries was full of the search after the hidden truths of our being, and it created that large field of practice and inquiry which goes in Europe by the name of occultism. We do not use any corresponding word in the East, because these things do not seem to us remote and abnormal as to the Occidental mentality. They are nearer to us, and the veil between our normal material life and this larger life is much thinner. So we see that Ashwapati, a skyward being, nourishing its roots on sustenance from occult spiritual founts, climbed through white rays to meet an unseen sun. This is a different sun than ours, because it is only a reflection of our sun. And we will, our sun is only a reflection of it, and we will only be able to see this sun when our being is fully purified. His soul lived as eternity's delegate. Oh, interesting word, delegate. Someone who is authorized to be a representative for someone else. So his soul, Ashwapati's soul, Sri Aurobindo's soul, lived as eternity's delegate. His mind was like a fire assailing heaven, his will a hunter in the trails of light. We begin to understand more and more that Ashwapati is a hunter for the divine verities that will bring a new force to earth, a greater and more powerful evolution, able to annihilate the falsehood, greed, and power lust that now predominates. An ocean impulse lifted every breath. Each action left the footprints 
of a God. We have so many beautiful lines in Savitri about the feet of the divine. I'll read just a few. All nature dumbly calls to her alone to heal with her feet the aching throb of earth and kindle her fire in the closed heart of things. And then when we Satyavan first meets Savitri and she's about to come out of her chariot, he says to her, Descend, O happiness, with thy moon-gold feet. Enrich earth's floors upon whose sleep we lie. Each moment was a beat of puissant wings. Puissant in Savitri is used eleven times, and puissance seventeen times. So it simply means having or exerting great power or force. That is puissance or puissant. And that line ends with a full stop because he wants to continue about himself and Ashwapati. The little plot of our mortality, touched by this tenant from the heights, became a playground of the living infinite. And these are my words. So the earth is a playground for the living infinite. And what have we done to her? Yes, her true purpose is to become divine, and Mother Earth will truly become so through the force and action of the supermental, as it rises in fullness from the earth. And those who will become its collaborators will join in assisting it to return to its beauty. Perhaps some of you have heard of my beloved friend Mona Pinto, who was for many years in charge of Golkund, a magnificent structure to house ashram inmates and disciples, whose construction was overseen by mother. Mother maintained it in, Mona maintained it in perfect condition for more than 50 years and mother called her my collaborator. How beautiful. This bodily appearance is not all. The form deceives. The person is a mask. Hid deep in man Celestial powers can dwell. Notice the word can dwell. Yes, they can and will dwell within us if we consciously open to them. His fragile ship conveys through the sea of years an incognito of the imperishable. Incognito is a concealed identity. So earth is a playground for the living infinite. And we see that this bodily appearance is not everything. Because when the time comes that we can see the soul in each other, we will see that this person, this form, is only a mask. Nothing more than a mask. Yes, we think of ourselves as, I am so and so, I am so and so. But that is only the form speaking, not the individual. The individual soul is the psychic being that grows with us through every death and birth. 
a spirit that is a flame of God abides. Now, the next quote is from the passage in Sri Aurobindo and the Transformation of the World, read to Mother by Satprem. This unpublished manuscript would become the first draft of the adventure of consciousness. And it goes, Nor was it insignificant that fire, Agni, was the core of the, of the Vedic mysteries. Agni, the inner flame, the soul within us. For who can deny that the soul is fire? The innate aspiration drawing man towards the heights. Agni, the ardent will within us that sees always and forever and remembers. Agni, the priest of the sacrifice, the divine worker, the envoy between earth and heaven, that's in the Rig Veda. He is there in the middle of his house. The fathers who have divine vision set him within as a child that is to be born. He is the boy suppressed in the secret cavern. He is as if life and the breath, he is as if life and the breath of our existence. He is as if our eternal child. O son of the body, O fire, thou art the son of heaven by the body of the earth. Immortal in mortals, old and outworn, he grows young again and again. A fiery portion of the wonderful, artist of his own beauty and delight, immortal in our mortal poverty. This sculptor of the forms of the infinite, this screened, unrecognized inhabitant, initiate of his own veiled mysteries, hides in a small dumb seed his cosmic thought. Now to share with you something about this seed image that Ranganath is so strong about. When we have a seed, let's say we have a little oak seed, and we plant it, can we see the huge oak tree that is coming out of that seed? Not yet. One day we will. So this seed is extremely important in this concept. Dumb here, of course, is always silent or mute. Not stupid. It's, that's colloquial English. And yet, he is a dumb seed. Hides in a small dumb seed his cosmic thought. In the mute strength of the occult idea, determining predestined shape and act, I'm going to go back, passenger from life to life, from scale to scale, changing his imaged self from form to form, he regards the icon growing by his gaze, and in the worm foresees the coming God. What, a, what lines? So we have to go back a little bit to uh, discuss some of these. In the mute strength of the occult idea. Now, Sri Aurobindo has a lot to say about the idea, and he capitalizes it here. In fact, sometimes, as a synonym for the supermental, he calls it the real idea. 
or the gnosis. So there are many terms he uses for the supermental. The idea is the realization of a truth in consciousness as the fact is its realization in power, both indispensable, both justified in themselves and in each other, neither warranted in ignoring or despi despising its complement. The idea is not a reflection of the eternal fact which it so much exceeds. Rather, the fact is only a partial reflection of the idea which has created it. He uses idea 69 times in Savitri, very often capitalized. Determining predestined shape and act. The word predestined is confusing to many people. And some say that if all is predestined, why do we have to do anything if everything already is already determined? So here we must go again to Sri Aurobindo and Mother. The dictionary defines the word as destined or appointed beforehand, foreordained, fated. But Sri Aurobindo writes on karma and rebirth the following. I am a persistent being who pursue my evolution within the persistent being of the world. I have evolved my human birth and I help constantly in the human evolution. I have created by my past karma my own conditions and my relations with the life of others and the general karma. That shapes my heredity, my environment, my affinities, my connections, my material, my opportunities and obstacles. A part of my predestined powers and results, not arbitrarily predestined, but predetermined by my own stage of nature and past action. And on this groundwork, I build new karma and farther strengthen or subtilize my power of natural being. Enlarge experience, go on with my soul evolution. So we see that everything is not predestined, but predetermined. So we are predetermined in our psychic being or in our soul that is above and that does not manifest to become divine, to become supermental. And it doesn't matter how long it takes, how many births and deaths, doesn't matter at all. And here from Mother is something very important. But there is there is indeed right in the depths of the being, especially of those who are predestined, that's understood, but still a being which not only presides over one's destiny, not only aspires for identification with the divine, but has the power to govern the circumstances of life and in fact to organize them in spite of the outer will, which very often revolts and does not want the circumstances as this inner consciousness, which is fully clear-sighted, has organized them. And it is only much later when one becomes aware of it and looks back at his life that one realizes that all this was wonderfully organized by a complete clear-sightedness of what was necessary in order to lead him there, just where he had to go. Most often the things which you took for accidents 
or misfortunes, or even tragedies, or even for the blows of fate, for attacks of the adverse forces, all this, almost all without any exception, was a marvelous, perspicacious, and admirably executed plan to lead you just where you had to go by the shortest road. Of course, this is not always absolute because it depends on the importance of the individual in relation to the importance of the surrounding circumstances. That's why I said at the beginning, predestined being. What I mean pre by predestined is a being who has come down upon earth to accomplish a precise mission and who, naturally, will be helped in the accomplishment of this mission. It may be a very modest mission, but it is a precise one that he has to accomplish upon earth. And what we learn from Mother and Sri Aurobindo is that each of us has a specific mission in this life. And it is up to us to find it. Some of us have been blessed by the Mother and we know our mission, our work in life. Others can still find it no matter what age, if they are sincere. Passenger from life to life, from scale to scale. So this is clearly that we are passengers on this earth, proceeding from life to life in a gradual evolution that is not flat, but spherical. It's very important. Each time we take birth, we move ahead on the evolutionary spiral. Changing his imaged self from form to form. And this is a very interesting thing, and I'll go into it a little bit. We do change from form to form. Sri Aurobindo says, usually not in the sex. If we were born as a woman, then we usually continue to be a woman in future births. There are exceptions. But he tells us that even in the worm, God is evolving. And the icon. Now the icon is defined as an image, a representation. When I was young and was brought into the Russian Orthodox Church, no statues were allowed because it was considered that no statue could represent God. So there were icons, beautiful icons. And now we learn that the icon, the representation of what we yet must become, is growing by our gaze, the light of the divine within us. At last, the traveler in the paths of time arrives on the frontiers of eternity. I think uh, probably we'll stop here for tonight. <laughs>